the first thing that I want to clear the decks about is the fundamental illogic that everybody seems to be following. All right? The atheist version, as a, the, the, the two different flavors, but they have the same problem. The atheist version of the illogic is going roughly like this. When you're five years old, you looked up at the sky and you immediately knew, just knew, somebody made it. It didn't get here on its own. You don't have to be an adult to know that God exists. It's self-evident. All you have to do is look up at the night sky. And when you did look up at the night sky, every single human being has gone through this. You immediately know somebody did this. Now, what do you do with that information? Well, most five-year-old kids run to their parents and say, how did, how did this guy get here? Who did that? And then, of course, the dilemma is, which version of God? But at, when you're five years old, it's not a dilemma. When you're five years old, whatever your parents tell you about God is what you believe. Because you believe in your parents. Now, your parents might be right or wrong, but you go with whatever your parents told you at that age. That's what every human being does. Okay? Later on, you want more. It's not enough to just look up at the sky and feel content. You want more information. Okay? If you were raised with a certain definition of God, you get into that definition. And then when you're in like your teens, especially like 15 through 20, you start to question what you were raised with. And just as universal as age five, you look up at the sky and you know God exists. Just as universally when you're in your teens between 15 and 20, you start to find out that what your parents told you is not as good or as true as you thought it was when you were five, six, seven, eight, nine. All of our parents give us wrong information. All of them. They give us some right information, but the bulk of what we learn from our parents is wrong. Because why? Because when our parents raised us, they were like 20s, in their 20s. By the time we're in our 20s, they're older and they've since you know, like gotten rid of a lot of the ideas they told us when we were five and they were in our tw their, their 20s. You see the point? You got babies raising babies for the most part. So there's a whole lot of disgruntled teenagers running around. Well, I looked around and what my parents told me about God was untrue and I don't like that so I'm going to throw out what my parents taught me and throw out God at the same time. But you know what? When you were five and you looked up at that night sky, you fell in love with the idea that God exists. The idea of God was good to you. And now when you're in your 20s and you're rebelling, you have to make the idea of God bad. So what do you grab onto? Another religion. Like evolution, for example. It's nothing more than a religion. There is nothing to support it at all in science. Zero. It's a it's a undocumented, unproven, no evidence assertion that people like so much they just keep perpetuating. There literally is no evidence to support it at all. And what evidence there is, is against it. Genes are like a rubber band. Okay, pretend that my fingers here were a rubber band. Okay, right here is where they break. They can do this, they can shape different, they can go, let me put it here, they can go like this, like this, like this. Okay, but at some point you stretch them too much, they break. If the gene breaks, the organism can't exist. So it can't transmute. Okay, period. Over now. 
There's no way it can happen. Got the lighting back. Okay, so since the gene cannot transmute, it can't stretch enough in mutations in order to stay alive, because mutation always subtracts from the longevity and durability of a gene. Because it can't do that, it can't transmute. That's the fundamental reason why Darwinian evolution could never work. And we know that from genetics, okay? But it's not being talked about. It's being talked about lately, but it hasn't been, wasn't talked about the first 20 years. So when you wanted to do your little rebellion against your parents, and you grab some other authority, okay, to justify your rebellion, Namely, the garbage you were taught in school about evolution, Darwinian flavor. There are other ideas of evolution that might work, but the Darwinian version can't. So you grab onto that in order to say, well, see, there's no God, because evolution did it instead. Really? Here's your logic, guys. How'd it get here? If evolution is, what is, is how we got here, how did evolution get here? any version, Darwinian or otherwise. And then the next trumping argument is, hi, in the Bible, Genesis 1, 23 through 25, since God authored evolution, now where are you? So that's a fundamental illogic on the atheist side. There's more to it than that, which I'll hopefully get into in this video. But this provides me the opportunity to flip over so the atheists don't feel picked on to talk about the Christian side. Since the Bible says God authored evolution in Genesis for fauna, in Genesis 1, 23 through 25, then why are the Christians arguing with the atheists over evolution? As if somehow it would prove... The atheists are being illogical because they think evolution, if it existed in the Darwin flavor, would prove that God doesn't exist, which it can't do. It can't prove that. The Christians are buying into the lie the atheists are buying into and saying and feel like they have to badmouth evolution in order to prove God exists. That's not true. So who's stupider? The atheists who are arguing that evolution proves God doesn't exist or the Christians who are trying to disprove evolution to say that God does exist. Both of them are ignoring what the Bible says. Hi, God authored evolution. And you atheists, you don't know how evolution got here. So you can't say that it disproves God's existence, because he could have just, boom, set it in motion. Okay, I set my computer in motion. It's doing its thing. I offer how it works. And then it does its thing. Well, God couldn't have authored a process about how the universe works? You can't prove God's existence ever from science. The most you can do is for the Christian, and this is why I'm so interested in science. How did God do this? How did he do all this? You look up at the night sky, you're five years old. You made this. You're God. There's a God there. How, and then when you're older, and the God idea hasn't soured in your mind, you say, oh, how did you do this? Because we want to understand God better. And we got the universe around us to tell us. Now, why am I bringing all this up? Because the non-thinker atheists and the non-thinker Christians are just muddying the waters of the God question. Yeah, there's a fundamental illogic in atheism. Okay, but on the flip side, why should you believe in a God who you can't prove exists? So you should be an atheist then, huh? But for a different reason, a thinking reason. Hi. If brain out exists, how am I going to know that unless brain out talks to me? Because you don't know that the, the person who's scratching her nose on the screen right now is really me. It's obviously a claim that I'm brain out because I'm talking. And you see a mouth moving with the words moving at the same time. So you have reasonable doubt that, that this would be fake. But you actually don't know that it's me. You wouldn't know that it's me unless you were sitting right here in the room and had contact with me to say, oh, yeah, you really are brain out. 
because you could see me working on my computer, you could see my passwords, and you would know that I call myself brain out on the internet, and all of my brain out mail coming right to this computer. That's the only way you'd have proof that I was me. So how much more do you need that same kind of proof from God directly? And if you don't have that kind of proof, why should you believe? You see the two sides of the coin here? The non-thinking atheist adopts non-thinking excuses for his non-belief. The Christian, who's also non-thinking, adopts non-thinking excuses for his belief. So they're both non-thinkers. They're both irrelevant. We should ignore them. So is there a thinking reason to be an atheist? Oh, yeah. Until you have proof directly from God that he's him, then how do you know? You should not believe that even I'm brain outing until you have direct proof in the flesh that I'm brain outing, which you'll never get. Because I'm supposed to stay anonymous. So now do you believe I'm brain outing or not? Do you believe God exists or not? And I submit to you that you should never, ever, not once, believe in God and especially not the Christian God until you get direct proof from God as contact. Well, how is that contact going to work? And this is the next illogical thing that the atheists go wrong on. They expect that supernatural God must be subject to nature. Then how would you know that he's really God? Hmm? If anything that's supposed to prove a supernatural God is restricted to nature, then you could explain it away as nature, and there would never be any proof of God. This is how Dawkins, in his God Delusion book, thinks, because he's not a thinker, thinks he gets away with making God not God. On page 41 of his book, he says, I'm only talking of supernatural God. Then on page 51 of his book, how does he define God? As the end product of an evolutionary process. <laughs> well, you realize what that did then. He made supernatural into subnatural, and he made God the product of evolution. Therefore, God is only God if he's not God. See? And I'm sure if Dawkins had half a brain, he would have never written that book. Or else he's a liar, take your pick. Because that's totally dishonest and totally embarrassing to show that kind of logic. Page 41, I'm only talking about supernatural. Page 51, oh, by the way, the definition of God is the end product of an evolutionary process. And therefore, in chapter 4, he concludes, well, it's very improbable for God to exist. Yeah, because he's made supernatural into subnatural and expecting you not to notice. So he's very dishonest, a scumbag for being dishonest. Or he's stupid. Take it back. That's what other that's the other logic in atheism. Is that they insist that the proof of a supernatural God must be done in the natural world. Really? Then you could always just say that what you thought was proof of God is really just natural instead. That's dumb, that's defeating, that's dishonest, that's illogical, and it's stupid. Okay, but flip side, what should be the logical proof then? Okay, what's the definition of God? God is the be all, end all, everything, created everything, outside time and space, doesn't have mass or energy, created it all. So then everything we see, at best, is a reflection of his existence, which we knew when we were five years old and looked up at the night sky. So what happened to that knowledge? Okay, but you're not five years old anymore. You're 15. There's all these arguments, especially against the Bible. How do you get any proof? And what have I been saying? Ask the ceiling. God, if you're really there, 
God, if you're really up there, I need proof of you. I need your head invisibly because you're supernatural and you have no mass. I need your thoughts to get into my head and I need proof that they came from you, not me. I need proof that it's not, it's not my hallucination. And if you're God, you're smarter than me. So the thoughts and things that you can make occur to my head will be smarter than me and I'd recognize they didn't come from me. And I need it all the time, constantly. Because, you know, the scientific experiment observation has to be run over and over and over again to test for anomalies. That would be your proof. Okay? Wouldn't it? That would be your proof. So you can, you can, with your body, empirically test any kind of continuing contact with God but the actual contact itself is invisible and supernatural coming into your head. And why would that be possible? Because according to the Bible, God made you supernatural by nature. The real you is not this. This is just an organic house. That's not you. Now, some people have attractive houses. Some people have ugly houses. Okay, but these are bodies. This, this all goes like into the ground. I wish mine went into the ground yesterday. I wish I was dead yesterday. I know God so well now, I don't want to live here anymore. Okay, but I am not. I don't get to have that. Some people think that this, this house of mine is attractive. Some don't. I don't like it particularly. If I could wear a burqa, I would. But, so what? It's no more me than my computer is me. It's no more me than my kitchen is me. It's not my use. The real me is inside here. The real me is made out of the same stuff as God is. God is spiritual by nature. God is a spirit. Okay? He made the soul at birth, Genesis 2-7. The real human being is not evolved only for that reason. This body stuff, the biological stuff, <clears throat> When it says he made it out from the ground, is that literal or figurative? I don't know. I don't care. I mean, Darwinian evolution doesn't work, but maybe some other version does. <clears throat> maybe man is a process of progressive hybridization, or maybe, and this is the theory that, that makes the most sense to me so far, maybe there is a massive blueprint that's part of what's called M-theory, string theory in physics, that there's this massive blueprint that's stored in black holes, and when they become star wombs and stars come out, imitating the Big Bang, that the whole blueprint of all of creation just starts multiplying. Okay, and then law of entropy, and it slows down and expands, and it's slowing down and dying while it's expanding, like gases do. Okay, maybe that's how we did it for the biological part of it, for the natural part of it, for this part of it. I don't know. I don't care. But the real me is a soul. And God made it directly at birth. My real father is God. So is yours. So, can the human being of himself know God? No. But can God make himself known to you? Yes. So now the question comes back into your lap, atheist. Do you want to know? The only way to believe in God is if you have direct proof from God directly. All of our words don't mean anything. We gotta help you brainstorm, help you analyze your own thoughts and understanding. That's about the most any you know conversation can do. It's not supposed to convince you. The only person who can convince you is you. I wouldn't want it any other way, would you? So, here's the question. Do you want that kind of proof? Yes, no. If yes, you ask the ceiling, God, are you up there? Over and over and over again. And when I said, you know, proving God, when I did that video, that's what I meant. 15, 30 minutes a day, preferably because this works faster. Reading some passage of Bible you don't like or you do like or you don't understand or you do understand. And saying to the ceiling, well, I, I, what does this mean in this passage? It sounds bad. 
makes you look bad. Well, it sounds good. It sounds too good to be true. It sounds like an escape mechanism. Whatever your objections are, cite them. Be honest. I get mad at God all day long. I argue with him all day long. So why can't you? I'm not better than you. I'm probably worse. Okay? So that's the illogic. The second illogic is to subsume supernatural underneath nature, which conveniently leads to the fact that you would never be able to prove God because he's supernatural above nature, and therefore, you know, if the keys are in the glove box and you insist on looking in the um, car trunk, you'll never find them because you don't want to find them. Now, it took me a little longer to say this than I wanted to. So in the next increment, I'm going to string this together as one long video. I'm going to come back and talk about Christian, the Christians who are irrational, okay, and non-thinkers, so that you atheists don't feel like you're being picked on. It is not my objective to pick on you. It's my objective to show a pattern, okay? So I'll be back in the next increment. I need some water. La Okay, so now we're going to talk about the Christian illogic, and it's the same kind of illogic as the atheist illogic. That's what's so remarkable about this. I didn't notice how much the two had in common until recently. Okay, the Christian illogic, like the atheist illogic, is trying to explain a supernatural God by natural means. Hello? How can we be so dumb? If God exists, he intended to have a relationship with you. Otherwise, why are you here? Okay, if he intended to have a relationship with you, that relationship is not going to be manifest by natural means. It's going to have to be communication to your head. That's why we have a Bible. See, because once you get the communication to your head, this was always a problem in the Old Testament. Once you get the communication to your head, how do you know if it really came from God? Or maybe you hallucinated it. Because you know what? We have lots of evidence of people hallucinating contact from God. How do you tell the difference? Yeah, check it with the Bible. Okay, but if you don't read the Bible, or you don't read it properly, or you don't really get into it, then you don't know if you're even reading the Bible right. So you don't know how to interpret what you're getting in your head. And you don't know how to interpret what you're seeing on the physical page. Okay? You have to have in any kind of clinical trial, the scientific now, because I'm involved with a lot of those kind of people for a living, in any kind of clinical trial, you have to have some kind of control group. Bible is the control group. It's a set of words on a page, everybody's got them. So you can test all the variations in all the other testing groups, which is all of humanity. Still got to cut my veins. With what you see in the page on the, on the text. Okay, but if you're not able to read that text, then you can't tell the difference. You can't tell that what's coming into your head does or doesn't contradict what's in the text. And if you can't read the text, you don't know what it's really saying. So whatever you think you know is going to be wrong, especially if you're working with a translation. Now, I've been trying to demonstrate just how important it is to get into the original Hebrew and Greek for what? Uh, how long have I been on YouTube? Five years. Going on six years. There's a huge difference. So it's illogical to assume that you know what God's saying if you aren't reading his book. And thousands and even millions of Christians are running around with all their little ideas about what that book says. 
and they don't even do their homework and they're using translations and really they're just flying off the seat of their pants like the atheists do. They're going by dear Dr. So-and-so and all his wrong ideas that nobody proofed or checked or corrected. They're just accepting dear Dr. So-and-so's ideas from 100 or 500 years ago. Everybody's treating the church fathers as if they were spiritual giants when they were spiritual pygmies. And they don't compare what the church fathers wrote to the Bible to realize how what the church fathers wrote was complete lunacy compared to scripture. So the Christians are not thinkers. They're not doing their homework. They're not analyzing the text. They're not analyzing what belief in God ought to be. So what do they come up with? Ritual? Religion? Religion? Come on, stupid. It's totally illogical to think that God would want religion. I do not need the ants in my yard right out there. I don't need their worship. I'm allowing the ants to live. I'm not spraying with ant spray to kill them. If they were aware that I could kill them, if they were aware of my existence and could kill them, and if they were also aware that, you know, well, but this person, because they don't know what human is, this person isn't killing me, and therefore they needed to give me all their sugar balls to worship me. I don't want the sugar balls. I don't need what ants can produce. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't help me. It doesn't do anything for me. I, out of whatever my motives are, just want them to go ahead and be free to be whatever they are, so long as they stay out of my house. Okay, well, God doesn't need us to stay out of his house. God has, in fact, adopted a plan of relationship to us that's intimate in here. But then that doesn't require religion. Religion is man doing all this stuff, hallucinating that he's doing something for God. You're not doing anything for God. You can't do anything for God. He's God, you're not. God doesn't need your worship any more than I need those ants to worship me. Now maybe the ants would want to worship me. Well, fine. And if I want to have an intimate relationship with them, and I used to when I was young, I used to create a little ant farm. I had a little ant farm. And I fed the ants, and I talked to the ants, and they looked at me, and I looked back. I used to really be big into insects. Ants, spiders, moths, butterflies. And I gave them things they could do for me. I even had a relationship with some gnats a few years back when I made the gnat gospel video. I taught them things, and it was pleasant for them and pleasant for me. And they biologically passed on all those lessons to the next generation of ants. It was really interesting to watch that happen. Okay, so God can invent a system of relationship to him so that you can have one. But that's not religion. So why are Christians trying to create and religify God? Well, that's because humans religify everything. We religify fashion. We religify hair. Oh, my hairstyle's better than yours. Huh? Who cares? So we religify relationships, too. We religify all of our relationships. That's what makes humanity such a pistol to live with. We religify everything. Okay, so Christian, why are you being such a non-thinker? Since you already know God exists, why do you fancy that you can do something for him. Huh? Why do you twist the words of scripture to turn it into an ego thing where you can do something for him? Here's why you do it. Here's why the human race is religious. It's called sin. Sin was born as a religious impulse. Genesis 3, when the woman takes the fruit. What was the attraction of doing that for her? When she had to know that mindless fruit cannot do anything to make you smart like God. Why'd she do that? It was her only way to rebel. She wanted to be as good as God by her own efforts. And that's what Satan told her that she could do. And she bought into that? Yeah! 
and we've been buying into it ever since. Oh, something I can do with this dead and Adam body is going to make me as good as God or make God have to owe me something. That's illogical and it's pointless and it's not even desirable. If you have a relationship based with, based with somebody else, anybody else, God or anybody, where they owe you, you know what kind of relationship that is? That's a relationship of hatred. When you go around and around saying, works, 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 I'm going to do some soul winning. That's a favorite for the illogical scumbag HEVO people. If you think you're going to do that, oh, what kind of relationship is that? I'm going to do great things for God. That's a relationship of hatred. Because you're expecting to get something for what you do and the other person owes you. That's what's so disgusting among the non-thinking atheists. They feel like they're, that, that God owes them something. Oh, really? What does God owe you? He lets you live. He's providing you breath and a whole world to live in every single day. And you're free to be whatever you want, do whatever you want, even be a scumbag. And yet he owes you for what he did to you, for you, you live. So what are you expressing, atheist? You're expressing hatred. What are you expressing, Christian? You're expressing hatred. You're a non-thinking, hating person. Oh, if I do this ritual, then God must bless me. I go to church, I do my little good deed laundry chore on Sunday. I bend and I stroke and I do the little ritual beads and I chant or I do whatever it is I think I'm doing that's so great and holy lighting a candle. And God's supposed to owe me for that. I did a good deed. What kind of language is that? The language of hatred. You're trying to get something from God. You think you can bribe God or bully God or talk God into something. So why should God listen to you? It always amazes me how whenever a tragedy happens at a school or 9-11 or there's some big disaster you know, like Hurricane Katrina, then all of a sudden everybody all over the world runs to their churches. What about the other 364 days of the year? And then everybody gets mad when they get sick or their loved one gets sick. Why did God let this happen to me or to him or to her? God is unfair. Really? Did you ever bother to learn him? No. Because you have a mental attitude of entitlement. And what kind of mental attitude is that? It's a mental attitude of hatred. Honey, if you hate me and you're nasty to me all the time and you're just dismissive of me, you know what I'm going to do? Walk away. What, we should expect God not to do that? And you know what the weird thing is? He doesn't. Every day I argue with him about this. Why don't you kill us, Dad? Why don't you kill us? We shouldn't be allowed to live. Kill me now. I'm not good enough to be alive. Yeah, but I never will be. Why are we so apt to blame God or to treat God as if he's supposed to be some kind of magic genie? The atheists are doing the same thing as the Christians. They're being illogical. God has an obligation to do for me. Oh, really? Says who? My ants. I don't have an obligation to do anything for the ants in my yard. They're lucky they're alive. They don't do anything for me. So what do you think has to happen even among Christians? who treat God so dismissively and derisively. They never learn his word. They just, you know, oh, well, it's good enough to read it in translation. And we don't even know Christ's birthday, even though it's disclosed in Haggai 2. Do you know how many women get upset when you don't remember their birthday? This isn't one of them. I could care less. I don't even remember my own birthday half the time. But a lot of women get upset if you don't remember their birthday. A lot of people get upset if you don't remember the anniversary of a wedding or a death. Or you don't show up at the funeral or at a wedding. Oh, you don't care. Yeah? Well, how much do we care about Jesus Christ as Christians? 
2,000 years have gone by and we still don't know when Christ was born. Hanukkah 4 BC says so plainly in the Bible. Of course, Paul, Paul's 2 BC and 4 BC, I still have to work that out. But how come a brain out can know and the scholars don't know? See, that's being illogical. That's being non-thinking. That's not doing your homework. And what's the motive for that? Hatred. I'm just going to take whatever I want to believe, and I'm going to come up with some fakakta explanation for what I want to believe. And I'll slap God's name on it, or I'll slap atheist's name on it, and, and see how good I am. Those are the non-thinkers in both Christianity and atheism. We need to get rid of them or just st start ignoring them. There are thinker explanations for both sides of the fence. An atheist should be an atheist if he doesn't have direct proof inside his head from God on a regular basis. And the Christian is supposed to get that every single day, 2 Corinthians 10.5. That's our lifestyle. It's God talking to your head and you trying to live before God, live out, learn and live on Bible. That's the spiritual life. There isn't any other kind. And to the extent you're not doing that, Christian, you're, you're saying how much you hate God. And I'm sure you'll bristle at what I'm saying now. And I honestly don't care. Just like I don't need the ants in, my, in the yard to worship me, I don't need your good opinion either. You know what I need? I need to live my life before Him. And one of the things that living my life before Him requires is for me to be real honest, if necessary, blunt and nasty when people are being stupid. Because when I'm dead, and it could be tomorrow, I have to account for why I, you know, what I did down here. Did, when I knew what was wrong, did I say anything about it? Did I speak up? Not that I'm supposed to go crusading. But Ezekiel 3 says you better speak up. And I'm 60 now. I might live another 30 years going by my, you know, biology. I might die tomorrow. So I'm obligated to be honest with you when it's off, when things are bad, and the non-thinking Christians and the non-thinking atheists are dominating the God question debate and the spiritual life debate, and they all need to be thrown away. Because I guarantee you, well, I don't guarantee you, Bible guarantees you, God guarantees you, that all the non-thinkers will be at the bottom of heaven if they ever once believed in Christ. Most of the atheists we argue with, they used to be Christians, so they're saved. If you ever once believed Jesus Christ died for your sins, and you probably did that when you were age five, if you're in the Western world, if you ever once did that, you're going to heaven. You can't get out of it too bad. But where are you going to be in heaven? You can't lose salvation, but you can lose the growth to spiritual maturity. Ephesians 4.13 says, that when, as a corporate group, churches reach the sort of corporate maturity, that's when the rapture happens. And that kicks off the tribulation. If you don't know that, if you dispute that, then you're spiritually age five. Because the, the whole tribulation and the millennium is an inheritance to Christ. And you're part of Christ's inheritance, Isaiah 53, 12. He inherits all the people. Everybody, because he paid for everybody, First John 2, 2. So if you're an atheist now, but you were, used to believe in Christ, honey, you're going to heaven. Okay, so now do you still want to be an atheist? Well, if so, you can. But if in case you want to know God, then ask the ceiling, okay, God, I'm an atheist now, but if you're really up there, I need some kind of systematic, constant, conversation going on in here and here's this Bible I'm looking at 15 minutes a day I need elucidation on it because that's John uh, 1426 it says he'll explain it to you you need a teacher but you also need the direct intervention of God to make it make sense so test that that's an empirical scientific test that you have to do over and over and over so do it 15 20 30 minutes a day for a month See what happens. See if you want to be an atheist after that. If, if so, fine. But just understand, if you once believed in Christ, you're going to heaven.
and you'll be at the bottom of heaven society. And there will be a hierarchical society in heaven because people like being low down here. They're not electing to know God. They're not electing to mature in the spiritual life. They're electing to get involved in their ritual, their religion, humanism, the football games, okay? Anything but God they're interested in. So they know nothing about him. The only way to learn anything about him is to learn and live on Bible for the purpose of learning him. If you're learning and living on Bible for any other reason, it won't work. So either get into it a whole hog because you want to know God, or go back to being an atheist. In any event, if you're going to be a non-thinker, then just get out of Dodge. Because I'm sick to death of interfacing with you. And if I encounter non-thinking comments in my videos, or when I make a comment elsewhere, somebody makes a non-thinker comment back to me, I'm not going to respond. Peace out.